Welcome back to European Space Flight. I'm your host, Andrew Parsonson. Today, I'm excited to welcome Orbex CEO, Chris Lamour. Thank you for joining me, Chris. Uh, would you mind starting by explaining a bit about Orbex and what you hope to achieve? So, yeah, first of all, thanks for inviting me onto your podcast, Andrew. It's, um, I think I'm about the sixth or seventh guest, and I'm sorry I couldn't make it earlier in the year, but we were pretty busy, as you <laughs> saw recently in some of our press announcements. Yeah, so Orbex is um, building a small launch vehicle to take small payloads to low Earth orbit. Um, it's a dedicated vehicle designed to deliver one small satellite or a number of even smaller satellites to um, relatively low uh, Earth orbits around 500 to 1200 kilometers in altitude. So we're launching from um, the north coast of Scotland and um, where we recently announced that we're taking over the spaceport project at Sutherland. Yeah, you, you talked about uh, Prime being relatively small, and it is relatively small compared to many of the other uh, launch vehicles being developed around Europe with a capacity of about 150 kilograms. What informed the decision to build your vehicle at, at that kind of capacity? There's three or four reasons there. The first is cost. Um, we, we believe that we can develop and launch this vehicle a number of times for about $100 million. And that's about the sum we've raised so far um, in the history of the company. If you go to a larger format um, capable of you know, lifting seven, eight, 900 kilograms, even a ton, you're probably going to spend three or four or five times that amount. And that's a much more difficult ask of the European venture capital market, in our opinion, anyway. Um, so I think if you look around the market, you can see that those developing one ton launches have spent around that kind of money for $500 million. And those at the lower end have been able to get launches uh, into the air for significantly less. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we, we think that this size actually provides a dedicated service rather than a kind of mini ride share service. Um, if you're developing launches again at a slightly larger scale, you're almost certainly going to have to share the payload fairing with someone else with a different set of orbital requirements and that automatically means you're compromising um, on a perfect launch and we'd rather provide our customers with the launch that they really want at the time they really want it so it's a really dedicated service and the last thing i think is that we want to be complementary to the existing european launch um, uh, scenario i guess where you have already launches lifting between one and two tons and much higher with the ariane group and uh, the Vega launcher from Avio um, in those two categories. We wanted to be in a niche by ourselves. And I think um, that's, that's, we're quite happy with that niche. That's where we are. And we're quite happy to be there. And uh, Prime is being powered by, by green propellant, um, which is obviously something that is becoming more and more important um, in the industry. And, and uh, Europe is also looking to, to, to place legislation that would require uh, companies to use these green propellants. What uh, uh, does this propellant over potentially legislative and just attractive marketing advantages? What sort of advantages does a green propellant have over a traditional fuel like RP1? Well, the reason why Orbex uses that particular propellant, which is biopropane, is, is actually technical in nature. Um, if we go back to, to small launchers and you look at a small launcher as a cylinder containing fuel, which largely what it is. I, just to annoy the engineers, I call it that with a computer on top and a, an engine on the bottom. And it <laughs> starts all kinds of interesting discussions directly afterwards. Um, but if you think about a launch vehicle as a cylinder filled with fuel, the larger you make that cylinder, the more efficient the launcher is. You've got a square law for the surface area of the rocket and a cube law for the fuel inside it. And conversely, the smaller you make it, the, the, the less efficient it gets. And propane, um, was the way that we solved that technical challenge by packaging the propane and the liquid oxygen in the rocket in a, in a new way using coaxial tanks. We're able to increase the performance of the launcher quite substantially, around 30% um, dry mass reduction versus more traditional designs where you stack one tank on top of the other. And that only works because propane will stay liquid when it's um, coexisting in a thermal equilibrium with locks around it. There's about a seven or eight degree overlap between the two. Um, liquids to stay in a liquid state. Um, so that's that's the core, core technical reason. Now, propane also is available um, in a bio-sourced um, 
supply chain. So you can have fossil propane coming out of the ground, or you can have it as a biomass produced product that's actually a byproduct from the manufacture of biodiesel, which is what we're using um, in our supply chain. So there's, there's two real reasons um, to deliver that. One is, one is the technical benefit to help the vehicle be more efficient. The other is we can actually use it um, as a renewable fuel with a very, very low carbon footprint. And primarily it's low because it's clean burning. It doesn't produce soot. And that's actually one of the biggest contributors to upper atmosphere pollutants from um, standard fossil fuel burning launch vehicles. They, they leave black soot uh, in a very high altitude. Black soot uh, is also bad for reusability because, uh, I mean, the more soot you have over your engine, the more difficult it is to reuse that engine. One of the less mentioned elements of Prime is that reusability. Uh, I assume mm. that's because you want to get the vehicle airborne before you start thinking about recovering and reusing it. Is that correct? Well, we, we started thinking about reusability right back at the beginning. In fact, we've already built full-scale prototypes of the reusability system with support from the European Space Agency. So they're actually in the factory right now uh, on a test harness. The uh, full-scale reusability system exists. Um, the, the problem, again, with this class of launcher is you can't just add more fuel and, and heavy landing legs because it, it won't sustain adding a few hundred kilograms in extra mass. So you have to think a bit more cleverly about how you get that vehicle back and reuse it. And that's where we've, um, we've made some steps forward, I think, in how we use the vehicle in a clever way to get the, the most valuable parts back and reuse. Excuse me. We have to cut that bit <laughs> and reuse them um, in another launch. You talk about the most valuable parts of, of the, the stage. I mean, that's the engines. The, the, the rest of the stage is relatively uh, inexpensive to produce. Does that mean that you're looking to just recover the engines and not the rest of the, the first stage? The first stage engines of a launch vehicle are probably around 50% of the entire cost of the vehicle. So um, for us, they're the most valuable components to get back from a launch, for sure. Um, if we get the stage one tanks back, that's great, but it's not the most valuable component. And they're relatively easy to manufacture the way we manufacture them. They take a few days to manufacture a complete suite of tanks for stage one. So it's not um, it's not something that we particularly need. We'd like to get it back, of course, but it, if it's damaged, it's not the end of the world. Either. The main prize is the engine package at the bottom of the launch vehicle. Perfect. So that is that is sort of what we're going for in terms of your recovery method is it's not the whole stage. It's a, an element of the stage. I'm, I'm no, I'm pushing here and I know you're trying desperately not to give me a lot of information. <laughs> I, I well, you can you can think what you like. OK, gotcha. Um, in May, um, Orbix unveiled the first fully stacked uh, Orbix Prime. Obviously, this was a great event. It was really cool to see a European rocket on a launch pad fully stacked. Um, is this vehicle still stacked? Um, and, and what exactly are, is being done with those components right now? Okay, so you can see it behind me on the screen there was uh, <laughs> the, the stacking event there on the test pad. So that, that vehicle is no longer on that pad. It's in the factory. We use that really, that pad is a, is a prototyping area, a test area for multi-engine testing, procedures testing, fueling, unfueling, safety, um, running up the various ground segment systems that control the launch table and the fueling systems and so on. It's, it's designed really as a testing area more than anything else. So putting that launcher on there for the first time in its various components, and it's not complete. I think anyone who looks at that picture will realize it's not complete. You can see there's some things missing. Um, it, was, it was a significant moment and just gives us all a, a nice sense of energy moving forward to the next stage. There's still a lot of testing to go before we build the se second version of that launch pad and put it onto the spaceport up at Sutherland, but it's it's a useful exercise um, for many reasons. The first is you get um, a head start on the spaceport being available to start practicing with the launch systems, the ground and the flight systems, the refueling systems. You find out issues issues that you can only find once you've actually built a prototype. Um, so there are some physical attributes of that launch table of that um, strong back that we're changing now in version two. Minor things, but things we would have found out at the last minute that we wanted to change rather than now when we've got a chance to build the second one. Um, it also serves us as a, a testing site for multi-engine testing, um, integrated testing of the, the main stage tanks with the main stage engines. It's a nice safe area um, in the middle of an old airbase, very close to our factories. One of the massive advantages we have is it's just three kilometers from our 
main factory in Scotland. Um, so if anything is needed from the factory, it's a very short drive back across to get, you know, whatever was missing or was needed for the rest of the day. Yeah. Uh, in October, you announced the closing of a 40.4 million pound Series C investment round. So obviously it was a big round. How important was this funding round for the future of Orbex? Well, we're a VC backed company. Um, you can't survive long on revenue from the t-shirts from your web shop <laughs> in, this, in this business. So um, it, it's an important component. You know, I, I often say that the real rocket fuel of a business like this is the cash. Um, the cash pays for the staff, good staff. It pays for the resources those staff uh, deploy into manufacturing the rocket. It pays for the facilities, the machines that we need to get all the work done. Um, it's a really important component. And we're very fortunate to have some very good VCs involved in the company, some um, of the largest deep tech um, venture capital companies in Europe, like Octopus Ventures uh, in the UK, BGF in the UK, and now the Scottish National Investment Bank from the UK, but also Hardcore, that's the largest VC in Denmark, um, and backing from Europe's largest seed fund, the high-tech Grunder Fund in Germany. So it's quite an international group of investors um, that have backed Orbex along its journey so far, and of course, a few angels and uh, private investors along the way too. In terms of that funding, you've now raised approximately 100 million euros. I mean, you, you talked about that 100 million dollars, 100 million euros. Mm -hmm. um, is that that's obviously is sufficient through to see the, to the first flight? Um, will it take you beyond that as well? Um, well, there's more coming uh, from other sources. I can't go into <laughs> what those are just yet, but there's more coming. And, um, you know, we, ex we expect that takes us through to operation and um, assuming things go well. Um, at a certain point in time, then I expect that to take us through to revenue and uh, profitability at some point down the line. It, the Series C or this additional element that's going to come? Well, in combination, but all, all okay. those things combined, yeah. The Series C is Perfect. the largest piece of it, though. Yeah. Uh, as part of that, that funding announcement, you obviously alluded to, to the money being used for unannounced future projects. You've already spoken about one of those projects that's taking mm -hmm. over the Sunderland Spaceport in the UK. Um, yeah. What is the strategic advantage of owning and operating your own launch facility? So there are, there are several advantages to it. The first one probably is just flexibility. So if you use a commercial spaceport and you rent the pad for a while, you're kind of constrained by other people, other customer wanting to use it as well. If you, you can't typically run over your launch campaign window, if you need to move out for someone else, there's also the moving in and out of all the equipment, um, the launch systems are bespoke to the rocket pretty much so um, rehoming that site for another rocket a different diameter a different power a different fuel means you've got to move all of your equipment off and someone else is in um, so just just having control of the launch cadence the launch schedule is a massive advantage um, for us with the reason we're based in scotland um, is to be as close as possible to our launch our home um, launch site which is on the north coast of the mainland. It's about a two and a quarter, two and a half hour drive from our factory, which again, keeps things nice and tight. And in this domain where you're launching quite small payloads, you don't want very long logistical lines of thousands of kilometers that add a lot of costs to the, um, the launch campaign. You don't want people flying halfway around the world and forgetting a spanner, right? Yeah, so, um, or if things go wrong, it's a long way to go back um, and, and get things repaired if need be. So having everything close to home, um, having a nice tight supply chain, allowing our customers to drive to the spaceport. Um, right at the beginning, when we were, we were assessing the various sites in the UK and Europe, you know, driving directly to the, the site was quite important to us. And, and so being on the mainland is an important component of our analysis of the various sites. In terms of, of the, the location of the launch facility, obviously, the closer you are to the equator, the more advantageous that uh, launch facility will be. Um, is there any disadvantage to launching as high up as you are? Uh, well, most of our customers would like to go into polar or quasi-polar orbits like, orbits like the sun-synchronous orbit. So the north coast of Scotland is actually fine for the majority of our customers. We don't have a lot of demand for the, those um, uh, lower inclination orbits that would require a launch site on the equator. Um, and there's often a misconception about that, that all launch sites need to be on the equator to get the assistance of the Earth's rotation. There, there, there is an advantage to being further north. Um, you don't have to counteract quite so much of the Earth's rotation as you, you get to those higher latitudes. 
Um, but for our customer segment, it's it's absolutely fine, no problem at all. In terms of of um, the construction of the launch site in Southern, and Jacobs has been contracted to manage the construction of Southern. Um, and they're also an investor in Orbex, and they were part of that that uh, Series C raise uh, around. How beneficial it, is it to have a partnership like that with Jacobs? Um, they are able to not help, not just help you with with funding, but also help you with the construction of Southern. So people probably don't know who Jacobs is, perhaps, but they're a very very large company. Um, they currently are one of the largest contractors, I believe, to NASA, including operations at the uh, Cape Canaveral spaceport. Um, and in addition to that, they run the Dune Ray nuclear site in the UK, which is near to where our launch site is, near being within uh, 100 or so kilometres, not, not right next door, I hasten to add. Um, and so they've got a lot of experience with um, highly regulated um, spaceflight projects, both from the USA and the UK. Um, they are bringing a lot of process knowledge, a lot of engineering knowledge, to the site um, where where they can. Some of it is control technology, so we're developing that in house. But it's a good partner to have someone who understands this domain, does construction projects like this, you know, uh, day in day out, um, understands regulation, and um, uh, understands our segment very well. Understands us enough to to know what we need from the site as well. And in terms of of, of the site itself. Um, you're obviously using green propellant. That's one of uh, your your pushes to be uh, uh, more green and more environmentally friendly. Uh, will the, the launch site itself also have the green elements, solar power, various other uh, green elements powering the facilities? Yeah, we've, we've designed the construction of the spaceport and the operation of the spaceport to be carbon neutral. So um, it's on it's on a piece of land that's close to um, environmentally sensitive areas. The, the piece of land we're actually building on has been worked in the past for peat recovery, for people using peat for fuel. If you look around the area, you can see a lot of um, cutting scars in, in the land there. And a lot of that's being repaired as part of the construction project. So any peat that's being removed will be used to repair the scars and the damage that already exists on that site. That's something that's not often understood about the site there. And it's, it's not actually part of any um, existing um, governmental protected areas where we're building. It's a fairly barren piece of land, if you've ever been there. Um, there are some sheep who live nearby, and uh, they're owned by our friends, the Crofters, at Melness Crofting's estate. Um, but um, it's, it's a relatively remote area. Um, the local village around uh, Melness and Tongue and Scurry, uh, a very small number of people, about 200, 300 people in total in those villages, and they're about three or four kilometers from the site. So um, we have a lot of support locally, I think, the vast majority of people there, I think it's a good thing. And um, we're already starting to think about the jobs we're going to put on the spaceport now. Um, many operators are going a bit more into the market now. Many operators have discussed launching at a cadence of around one flight per week, which is obviously an insanely large, uh, large uh, uh, launch cadence. Will Orbex need to be launching at that kind of uh, rate to remain competitive in the market? Or have you got a, a different uh, uh, model? No, I mean, I see some of those numbers and I, I, I don't think that they're highly credible, some of them. <laughs> you can see some people talking about launching once a day, which is, uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how they're going to achieve that. But our, our, our internal intent is more modest. If we can, if we can get a, a launch running once a month, that's a very good business for us. We're, we're doing very well operationally and um, we'll be doing just fine financially. But even lower than that, actually, get, keeps the business running quite happily. We, we don't even need to get to, you know, 10 or 12 launches to have a, uh, a stable business. Um, but the single pad at Sutherland is designed to allow us to launch 12 times annually. And that's a perfectly adequate business for this company. In terms of, of keeping the lights on, bare minimum, how many launches per year? Yeah, I don't want to say that number. <laughs> Thought I might get lucky there. <laughs> um, Recently, uh, there's been two joint statements released regarding opening up European institutional contracts uh, to a competitive bid bidding process. Uh, the first was from a consortium of European new space companies, included a bunch of, of launch, um, various others. Uh, and the second was from the French, Italian and German governments. Mm -hmm. Neither the UK nor Orbex were featured on either of those statements. Um, why is that? 
Well, I, I, I can't speak for the UK government, but I can tell you my, my views for, from a point of view from Orbex and, and our view on the broader industry there. So we, we um, our, our class of launcher doesn't need the ESA payload market to survive. And it probably does, doesn't need or probably can't access the EU payload market now that the UK has left the European Union. Um, again, if you come back to our payload mass, it's about 150 kilograms, so up to 200, depending on the altitude. There aren't that many institutional payloads from either ESA or the EU that will fit our launcher. You know, if you look at Galileo, it's 675, 700 kilos. If you look at the Copernicus Sentinels, they're over a ton, uh, 11, 1200 kilograms. Uh, the new Iris program, I don't, I'm not sure what it'll be, but I'm sure it won't be, you know, 100 kilos of <laughs> For a satellite, exactly, yeah. um, just based on the budget that I saw put out for it, 2.4 billion, they're probably looking at something quite significant there. Um, and then if you look at the ESA payloads, they tend to be more significant too, 400, 600 kilos or higher, uh, multi-ton in some cases. So there's not a lot of market there that's super interesting to Orbex. We, we, our business model doesn't need that market to, to be successful. We think there's plenty of um, smaller satellite customers in Europe and elsewhere that will be looking at our service and be quite happy to be flying with us um, without needing that market open. Um, when it comes to the, the statement by the various nations, um, I mean, two of them have a vested interest in, uh, in sustaining their current position, which is fair enough. Um, I, think, I think it's interesting to read between the lines, which I think you did in a recent newsletter, um, to understand what was really said in that uh, that statement by those three nations and the timetable in particular is interesting so whether it's really an opening or um sort of a, uh, how can you say it like the door is ajar i don't know but it, I, I think it's going to take much longer than than some people expect uh, for that market to really be open and and you know to be honest the, you look at the word operational in uh, in that statement and that tells you a lot right if you want to be in this market you have to prove you can actually deliver institutional payloads and that's probably the table stakes to be um, involved in it. In that newsletter that you referenced, I talked about um, that some of the companies that did sign on for that, inst the, the, the new space companies, their motivations might not have been entirely pure and they're, they're, they have a vested interest in those uh, payloads being opened up to them and they, they might even require them to stay competitive in the market. Is that your belief as well that some of these companies do 100% require ESA payloads at a slightly inflated launch services cost to be able to, to stay afloat? I, I, I don't know their business economics, but I'm, I mean, it's all helpful, right? If you've, got, <laughs> if you've got access to a market that's flying, you know, 12 or 14 one-ton payloads a year and you're a one-ton launcher, that's a market you'd like to have a little piece of, I imagine, right? Um, but I don't know if, it, if they need it, uh, need it. To, to be in business, there's plenty of other opportunities out there, I would imagine. In terms of other opportunities, you've obviously already started to sign um, customers onto to Orbex Prime um, flights. Um, can you give me a bit of idea of how many flights you've already sold mm -hmm. um, and how many customers you have waiting for, for Orbex flights? Yeah, we sold six flights already to five different customers and there are three more um, that, that we haven't announced. Uh, that are in the pipeline now. Um, they might be announced, they might not be announced. We'll see what happens there. Um, and we also have a more strategic agreement in place um, to, to do other things, but I can't really talk about that one right now. Perfect. Um, you're currently targeting to get uh, prime operation, well, not operational, for a first flight, you're looking at 2023. Um, yeah. Obviously, from now until 2023, there's a lot of milestones, milestones that you'll have to complete. Um, what are these milestones and when do you expect them to happen? Um, so <laughs> I'll answer that indirectly if I can. We were at a board meeting last week and um, our, our chief development officer decided to illustrate to the board just how big the development plan was. He printed it out on um, A0 A A sheets of paper, uh, or A1 sheets of paper, and there were 36 of them. <laughs> spreading down the okay. corridor, uh, just so it was clear to the board of directors just how many line items are in the R&D plan. Um, now, we're about, uh, I would say, about a year or so away from launching. But as I always say when I get asked this question, uh, you know, I'm going to be wrong on that date, 100%. Things always 
happen, right? Whether it's external things like COVID, um, whether it's Brexit, whether it's an internal R&D issue and there's been some issue that needs to be solved, whether you put a part out to a supplier and they make a mistake and it has to go around again and it causes a two or three week delay, things happen. There are so many wheels turning in a business like this. It's, it's you know, you have a plan, but there then reality happens and you have to adjust that plan almost daily to understand where you really are. And um, I, I think I think we're quite honest about timescales um, to ourselves. We, we, we know things always drift slightly to the right. Um, there are a couple of things that our um, chief commercial officer and chief technology officer say that, that always resonate with me. The first is from the, the chief commercial officer, Jan, um, always says that customers don't want an on-time failure, uh, which I think is <laughs> probably very true. Um, and then when you ask the CTO, uh, Jonas, you know, when are we going to launch? He'll tell you when we're ready. <laughs> and, and I think that gives you the internal kind of ethos of the company right there is we'd rather we were launching something that we had very strong confidence was going to go quite well than trying to meet somebody else's time timeline that might drive us to make mistakes. That's that's the internal kind of thing. So there's there's a lot of focus in the in the UK, particularly about being first uh, to orbit or first to launch or whatever. But actually, I, I often say, um, both internally and to investors, I, I want, I, I'm more focused on being here in 10 years than I am on being the first to launch. I, you know, I think there's a big kind of ego thing around being first to launch, but I'm more interested in making sure that the company is still here in 10 or 15 or 20 years and growing and um, surviving um, and being viable and sustainable beyond that initial launch. Yeah. Well, Chris, um, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Um, good luck on the road to the launch pad, and I look forward to seeing the Maiden Fights of Prime. Thanks very much, Andrew. I look forward to, to hearing um, what this sounds like when you finally bring it out. And uh, <laughs> thanks very much for your interest. Wex. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining me for my rambling conversations with interesting people. Keep an eye on YouTube and your favorite podcast service for the next episode. Until then, remember, it's a beautiful day for launch in Europe.